Well, that is a lot of text that we just read. And hopefully some of it uh, sinks into our consciousness as we hear it. Um, the, the beauty of four readings a week of this length is that we actually, if we did that weekly, would get through about the entire Bible in three years, three to five years, depending on what all we, uh, we incorporated into that. And there's something about hearing. Our, Bible, our uh, children's story was about the senses. Each of them make a kind of distinct memory. And some of you are auditory learners. You hear things and you learn them or remember them. Most of you are visual learners. That is to say, you see something and that registers and you begin to learn from seeing. And many of you are also kinetic learners. That is to say, you learn by acting or doing. So uh, probably when we combine all of them, we have the best results. And here we sit and listen. So I guess I get to be the kinetic piece and the visual piece. And uh, anyway, something to think about. The auditory piece, though, comes to us with this word now that we've been presented. And we have several things that work for us in season. And I know it's hard to be mindful of this day to day, so I'm just going to remind you of it, frankly and bluntly, right now. These texts each anticipate something or speak to something, a present reality. And the present reality in the calendar that we're living in, the Christian calendar right now, is that Christ has been resurrected from the dead. That's the present reality. We're very close to celebrating the ascension of Christ in the calendar, Christian calendar, and we're very close to Pentecost, celebrating the arrival of the Spirit. So our text in... John, John 14, is a gospel text that actually predates Jesus is speaking prior to his crucifixion. But it anticipates something really beautiful and something important. John 14, 15, 16, parts of 17, these passages are Jesus' talk to his disciples before his crucifixion. It's his last sermon. And it's a very eloquently and beautifully presented hope that believers might be one in him as he is one with the Father. And that we might find unity once again with God. And that we might be in God and God in us. That we might be in Christ and Christ in us, new creations. So this hope that's articulated is a very powerful one in 14, 15, 16, through prayer. And Jesus is talking about how we demonstrate that we love him. And this is not the focus of my sermon today. But if you love me, keep my commands. My commandments is another way of saying it. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. And then what does it say in verse 17? Who is that advocate? I can't hear you. Yeah, the Spirit of Truth, the text says, capital S, Holy Spirit. So while Jesus is speaking this, he's with the disciples. He goes through his death and resurrection. He appears to the disciples multiple times and to over 500 people in the course of his time on earth after his resurrection. And then he's speaking to the disciples, of course, after his resurrection as well. But he's been promising them before his death and now since his resurrection that when he goes back to the Father, he's going to send a comforter, an advocate, another. And that would anticipate Pentecost coming up, in which the disciples are gathered in the upper room along with their families and others, and the Holy Spirit descends upon them in a very dramatic way. And they begin to proclaim the gospel in a way that they've never been able to proclaim it with the power that is immediately apparent. And as the Jews were gathered for uh, the festival of Passover, as Jesus was being betrayed and, and about to be crucified, so they are gathered again for the festival of Pentecost and they get to see the Spirit, the promised advocate, acting in great power and in great might through the apostles as they preach. And this apostolic gift, as it's called, becomes the gift of the Spirit given from one leader to the other, uh, transmitted. In Jesus' case, he did it two ways, by breathing on people, which is wonderfully symbolic, and in, 
by laying on of hands. And so that's where we get the tradition of ordination. It recognizes that the one being ordained has been put into order, that is to say, been taught and trained, and it also recognizes the impartation or the recognition of the gift of the Spirit in that person's life. So these are the things that uh, Acts 17, or excuse me, John 14 uh, points to right here and reminds me of. So um, I'm glad we could read that together and uh, be reminded of how we demonstrate our love for God. We love God in that we love him supremely and our neighbor as ourself. Acts 17, the next text, takes place at a very interesting spot. How many of you have been to Athens? Anybody been to Athens? A few of you? I see a couple hands and you were there with me, so that's really cool. Or maybe not. No, you were there independent. Okay. Well, Athens is an amazing place, and up on the hill is this Areopagus, that's, as it's called. And classic, gorgeous building that we all know from studying from 6th or 5th grade on. The Parthenon is up there. And there are several other temples. And there's a little subhill just off of the entrance to this complex where Paul stood to give his sermon, as it's called, on Mars Hill. And this is where he's delivering the message that we're reading now in Acts 17. Paul has an unsuccessful time in Athens. It's very worth noting because we think of Paul as nothing but successful everywhere he went because he established churches everywhere, all over Asia Minor and Turkey. Paul established churches everywhere he went. He was heard in the synagogues. He was well-received. But he goes to Athens, the center of culture and learning. He goes to Athens, the center of philosophy. He goes to Athens, and he's a very astute teacher. He looks around the city. He studies their culture for a bit. He listens to the men debate in the marketplace. He hears the philosophers. He looks at the markers, goes to the temples, observes the religiousness of the people. He's a student of the place in which he's going to speak. That should teach us a lot, shouldn't it? And he gets to Mars Hill, and he has a bit of an audience, and he says, men of Athens, I can see that you're very religious. I can see that you care about finding the truth. I see that you care about being seekers, knowledge and wisdom. I have something I want to share with you. What I want to share with you is about the resurrected Christ. We find that in verse 31. He says, if I looked at your objects of worship, I found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. And so while you worship this unknown God, you know nothing of him. And I'm going to proclaim something about that unknown God to you. And then he proceeds to talk about the creator. And the one who has not just created the earth and all that it, in it is and humans, but has set up time and history in itself. He says in verse 27, God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from any one of us. And I quoted this last week. For in him we live and move and have our being, as some of your own poets have said, were his offspring. So I love this passage because the closeness of God to each of us, whether we believe or not, whether we have doubts or not, whether we have question marks in our minds or not, whether we are you know, here every week or not, or whether we've never been to church before, or have only been occasionally, whatever our story is, God is very near to us. As if we could reach out and touch him. He's the ground of our being. We're his children, his offspring. So Acts 17 is, an, is really a treatise against idolatry. Paul is making a case to the men of Athens on the basis of an unknown God that they have recognized and worshipped, that there is indeed a creator God who is Lord of all, subject to no other God and second to none. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. He is the supreme God, the creator God. And that really, if we're going to honor him, we cannot honor him in substance or form because we ourselves are living substance and form. If we are children of God, his offspring, 
To make idols of wood and stone doesn't represent us, let alone represent him. So Paul makes this case to the men of Athens, trying to turn them in just a few clever moves from people who worship all kinds of different things and have all sorts of different philosophies and understandings to a people that will accept what should be obvious to us all, that there's a design to the way in which things are, that we are grounded in a reality not of our own making, and that this grounding, this existence we experience could be indeed based on this creator God. So Paul's argument in Acts 17 is against idolatry. Now, it seems really strange, and I want to make this comment because it doesn't seem relevant to us. Verse 29, we should not think that divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands people everywhere to repent, for he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he's appointed, Jesus Christ. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. So this passage is anchored in the resurrection and in the creation and in the presence of Jesus in this earth. But the key is no idolatry. And Paul is making this case of no judgment or judgment coming out of this because while we don't have the problem with making idols of silver or wood or stone, we do. I'm not accusing anybody here of idolatry. But while we only gather weekly, only weekly, there are things important enough in your life to have kept you, many of you, from being here at 11. I'm not accusing anybody here of idolatry, but it was more important for almost everyone here to be doing something other than engaging the study of Scripture at 9.30. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. No judgment. Don't walk out and go, Pastor, that was harsh. Hey, I, I, didn't, I didn't make you do anything this morning. I was, a, well, actually, I was fairly close to on time this morning, which I confess is good for me. I'm 9.32 or something, I rolled in. I don't know what it was. It was pretty close. It's not just Sabbath morning either. It's the way in which we structure our lives. Where do you spend the most of your time? What do you think about the most? What do you spend most of your money on? These are the things that are most important to you. Any of you see that incredibly wonderful, fabulous movie called Devil Wears Prada? Oh, if you haven't seen that, rent it, watch it tonight. It is, okay, I know it sounds like a chick flick and I'm a guy, but it is on my all-time favorite movie list. It is just too good for words. There is a scene in there where the young man who is dating Anne Hathaway is having a very intense conversation with her about their relationship, and her boss calls on the cell phone, Miranda calls. And it's ringing and ringing and ringing. And he says, go ahead and answer it. And she does. And he says, I tell you what, the person whose call you take, that's the person who you're in relationship with. And they break up. Great line. Great line. Whose call are you taking? Right? This is the essence of the, the question. Whose call do you take? Do you ever answer the call of God? Is that the call you take, or is there some other call that's ringing that's just more important, more immediate, more urgent? Now, I hope I'm not beating you up. I'm not trying to leave with anybody bloody today. You're here after all, right? I'm preaching to the ones who aren't here. I, I'm well aware of that. But what I'm trying to get us to understand is that almost anything in our culture can be an idol. It can, be, it can be as base as our sexuality, or it could be as complex as our schedule. It could be a car or an object. It might be a person that we think way too much of and obsess over way too much. Almost anything can function as something that keeps us from the worship of the true God. We might worship ourselves. 
don't know. Only you can decide what that is for you. Only the Holy Spirit in working on your heart and mind can help you understand where your priorities are out of order. But Paul is simply saying, men of Athens, there's a creator God who's supreme. And it's evidence because Christ came, was crucified and resurrected, and will judge the world. And here's the thing. He's not far from any of us. We're made in his image, and he's the basis of all reality. Now, what are you going to choose? Is that a fair summary? Was that a little more accessible to you? Oh, come on. Okay, time for me to find another profession. Thank you very much. The Bible is accessible, but it takes some work, doesn't it? We can't just hear these words and say immediately, oh, yeah, I get that. We got to look at it. We got to think about it. We got to process that a little bit. I wish it were a little more accessible, but it was written 2,000 years ago. Give Paul a break. He's talking about idols of wood and stone and silver, and we say, that doesn't, what does that have to do with me? I don't have a, a crutch at my home with some sort of thing I worship. No, but what do you worship? Where do you spend your time? Whose call do you take? Let's ask those questions. We get to our psalm. I love the psalms. Sometimes theologically they trouble me. Because I'm not always convinced that it is God that does the things that the psalmist says God does. I'm not always sure of that, to be candid. But I love how the psalmist always sees it through or is honest about his emotions in relationship to his theology. Praise God, all peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard. That's pretty inclusive, isn't it? Why? He's preserved our lives and kept our feet from slipping. Now he goes into something extraordinary. He says, for you, God, tested us. You refined us like silver. I think I'm good with that. But here's how he frames the next part. You brought us into prison and laid burdens on our back. You let people ride over our heads. We went through fire and water. Ah, but you brought us to a place of abundance. What do you think the psalmist is referring to there? I heard it. Egypt. A little louder, everybody. Don't be shy. You can be wrong. It's okay. Even I get it wrong up here. Egypt. You tested us. You brought us into prison. We were slaves for 400 years. You laid burdens on our back. We had to work terribly hard. We went through fire and water. Boy, those are the trials that we speak of, aren't they? And they're symbolic as well. But you brought us to a place of abundance. And where was that? Canaan. You brought him to Canaan. So he says, therefore, I'm going to come to your temple with burnt offerings and fulfill my vows to you. Those promises I made when I was in trouble. You ever make a promise to God when you're in trouble? Don't lie. Don't add one sin to another here. You've done that. You've said, okay, God, if you'll get me out of this, I'll do X, Y, Z. Did you do it? It's not too late. Better take care of that. Psalmist says, I made vows to you when I was in trouble. When I was going through these trials and these difficulties and these hard places, I made promises to you, and now I'm going to fulfill them. And again, we go to this. I can't relate to this at all. I'm going to sacrifice fat animals to you. What? I know how to barbecue, but I don't know anything about this. And actually, I don't. I'm lying. I don't know how to barbecue. Scott Scotto knows how to barbecue. Where are you, Scott? We'll all eat Scott's barbecue. Seems irrelevant, doesn't it? The psalmist is going to bring sacrifices to the temple, but what have you promised? What are you bringing? What are you putting before that word you've made to God? What are you forgetting that he's tested you in? Trials that you've come through and he's brought you out of. Bad places you've been and good places where you stand now. 
Verse 16, come and hear all you who fear God and let me tell you what he's done for me. What is your testimony? This is, this is what we've been talking about. Last week I walked among you and I asked you some questions and you answered beautifully. But what would your testimony be? What would your story be? What would you say if I said to you, tell me what God has done for you? Can I tell you what you should be able to say? And if you can't, you ought to do some more thinking about it. What you should be able to say is, Pastor, there isn't time enough to tell. There isn't time enough to tell the stories. My memory isn't big enough to contain them all. What has the Lord done for me? I cried out to him with my mouth. His praise was on my tongue. And then he does this aside. If it was about sin in my heart, he wouldn't have answered. But it wasn't. He's heard my prayer. The Lord has not rejected me or withheld his love from me. Does God hear this prayer of sinners? I just want to be clear about this. Yes, he does. So the psalmist has this theological idea that I'm not sure I agree with. He thinks that if there's anything in his life, any kind of sin in his life, God is not going to hear or answer his prayers. That if, if his motives are in some way other than holy, pure, God is not going to hear or answer his prayers. We know better, don't we? Can God be bribed truly? No. Can he be coerced? No. God cannot be coerced or bribed. He can't be, he can't be moved in any false way by you. He just can't. When you cry out to him, wherever you are, whatever mix you're in, whatever your questions, he hears. He responds. God has not rejected me or withheld his love from me. But the psalmist reminds us that we have a story coming out of tribulation and trial. We have a story of the way God has been with us and led. And this, in my mind, anticipates both the coming of the Spirit and celebrates the resurrection in which time we find ourselves. We've been through, symbolically in this season, the crucifixion, and now we live in time of resurrection. Let praise be on our lips. Let us be able to speak to the glories of a risen Christ and a God who loves us. Second reading of the New Testament, 1 Peter, is really where we're going to land today, where my title comes from, kind of stiff as that title is. Why don't you turn to 1 Peter 3? You have your pew Bible, it's page 1124. Or if you took one off the stand, see if you can find 1 Peter 3 uh, all by yourself in that new Bible that you borrowed or took or whatever is uh, received. We all understand, or at least if we know anything about the biblical times, we understand that when people did things that were bad, when they were rebellious or idolatrous, when they left the way of the Lord, they expected that tragedy would come. And if we look at the story of Israel, that's in fact what happened time and time again. When they left the path, when they forsook their identity as children of the living God, when they forgot whose image they were made in, when they turned the wrong way, invariably, things did not go well in Israel. Okay? So now we come to 1 Peter, and it is not telling us what we ought to expect when we're doing things that are wrong or bad. It tells us how we might see things if we're doing good, but that's not well received. We live in a place and a time and an age when very interesting things are happening in this country. And I just want to make this observation very quickly. It's firsthand. I've seen it time and time again. Federal law protects us religiously. The Constitution protects us in terms of freedom of religion and free exercise of religion. State law, step down, more or less affirms federal law. But local law doesn't pay any attention to state or federal law. 
So what we have is municipalities that will allow one home to have a party, a block party or whatever, a group party at its home, with music playing at unbelievable levels until 11 o'clock legally and 2 o'clock unofficially. Any of your neighbors done this? Oh, you haven't heard the thump, 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 thump all night long? Okay. They can have 80 people in a house and be drinking and doing all kinds of things. Uh, getting, I mean, not just drinking, getting smashed and doing all kinds of things. And maybe a police officer will drive by and tell them to quiet down. Maybe he won't. But that, that party will not be shut down. But there are municipalities that are giving cease and desist orders to people that are having Bible study in their homes with 20 and 30 people because it violates some kind of code. The city of Ventura just recently told a church that they had to discontinue their Feed the Homeless program because the neighbors were complaining that it brought the wrong element into the area. So now a municipality has ordered a church to cease doing something that the church considers to be part of its ministry, considers part of the good that it's doing in the world because those in the community aren't accepting of the clientele or the people that they're seeking to minister to. What does the church do? Have they done evil? Apparently the neighbors don't like it. They haven't done the wrong thing. They haven't done the wrong thing at all. Are their actions protected under the state or the constitution or federal law? Probably. I don't know that that's been tested. I don't know that any one congregation in Ventura has the resources to take it to a local court and then to an appellate court and then to a state court and then to a state Supreme Court and then to a U.S. Supreme Court. I don't know that it can go through all that. I don't know that anybody has that kind of money. So functionally what's happening is local government is beginning to interfere in the religious life of its citizens if it so chooses to do. Those of you who know the history here know how difficult it was for us to get back the right to have Christian education on this campus. We had to fight and spend real money. I think Paul probably remembers. He put a few hours in on the project. So what happens when we're doing good in our lives and people don't approve? What happens when we're criticized or worse, persecuted in some way for doing good. What I hope will happen in Ventura is I hope that the church that has been ordered to do this cease and desist the homeless many will continue their ministry. What I hope they will do is politely rebuff the officials and say, we understand that you have a concern, but you need to understand this is part of our ministry. A ministry protected by the freedoms in this country, a ministry we feel strongly about, and we must continue. We're called to continue this. I would hope that they would try to create ambassadors to their community and reach out and do what they can to change public opinion. But if they're unsuccessful in that, I would hope that they would stay the course and face the consequences and see how it plays out. Who knows what they're called to right now on all of our behalf? You see... Paul, or excuse me, Peter in this passage is addressing what happens when you are reviled for doing good? What happens when people don't approve when you're doing good things? What happens when you're not doing anything to uh, nullify the cause of Christ, when you're not committing sin or evil? You're on the right track, but people don't get it or don't approve. This is where our faith gets tested and tried and lived out. I suspect that we're all idolaters in one form or another, but not in a way that would make anybody criticize us, at least not from the community. I suspect we all understand that we've been through difficult times and God has brought us through, and that we can speak with our mouths to the stories of redemption in our own experience. But this question, who's going to harm you if you're eager to do good? And then he answers it. Oh, but even if you should suffer for what is right, count yourself blessed. Don't fear or be frightened. But in your hearts, honor Christ, revere him, worship him as Lord. 
The next part is tough too. And it goes to the sermon series we are on. Always be prepared to give an answer for your faith. We're looking at that right now. Why is it we believe what we believe? What is it that we believe actually? What are the basics that draw us back together week after week, year after year? Just a little aside that I'm not going to touch. There's a very interesting um, passage here in 18, 19, 20 that is uh, controversial for Adventist theologians and difficult for Adventist theologians because what it appears to say is one of two things. It appears to say either Christ in spirit form went to preach among the spirits in hell until he was resurrected and that therefore preaching to them would imply that they have a chance to repent again, having not repented when the floodwaters came the first time. Or it seems to imply that he just, he did, he did preach, literally preach to those in that spot. Fortunately, uh, we have very good theologians who in reading this and working it through and taking the whole of scripture together have ways that help us through this passage, and I would encourage you, if you're interested in that, to study it. But what I want to get to quickly is, what were we saved through? Eight were saved through water, is the point Peter's making. Eight righteous went through great tribulation, but were saved through water. And now, the water that destroyed the world symbolizes baptism that saves us also. Not by removing dirt, but by a clear conscience where God is concerned. And then he makes it plain. It saves you by the resurrection of Christ, who has now gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. It's that last part that I want us to leave with this morning. When we talk about a basis for faith, when we talk about something that helps us understand, when we look at that which saves us, Peter makes it pretty clear. Saved by the resurrection of Christ, who has ascended and been glorified and advocates for us now as high priest. Well, I don't know if I was able to successfully bring four divergent texts into something cohesive for you today. But I do want us to think about how it is that we live this faith that we claim in the here and now. What are we going to do when it's tested and tried? Not for evil things that we do, but for the good that we try to do in the world. How are we going to respond? What will anchor us and ground us What'll be our hope? And I want to tell you right now that the resurrection of Christ is at the center of it all. Yes, he died. Yes, he was crucified. We have a timeline on all of that. But the resurrection is the focal point. Because out of the resurrection comes the hope of glory. And out of the hope of glory comes the promise of a spirit who will lead us to that day. We have a God who's with us, who made us, who loves us, cares about us, who's redeemed us, who's called us, who's held us up, whose stories we could tell if we but thought about it. How will you live your faith when tested? How will you live your faith as tried?